Hello, my name is Bill Copeland. I'm here to uh, help host the 33rd presentation of Bay to Bay. This is a time when we show speakers from Monterey Bay all the way up to San Francisco Bay. We're going to show you what Toastmasters does, and maybe we'll have a little fun in the process. Our meeting is going to be in three parts. First, we're going to have table topics. Then we're going to have a very interesting prepared speech. And finally, that prepared speech is going to be evaluated. So welcome. I hope you have a good time. Now, the first thing is, as I said, table topics. We have a number of table topics. Table topics are an opportunity for a speaker to be able to learn to speak on their feet without any preparation at all. It's a little scary, and one of the scariest things we do in table topics is table topics in Toastmasters. So I will give the table topic, and then I'll call on a speaker, and they have not heard this topic before. So the first topic is, ta -da. <clears throat> what do you suppose Silicon Valley will look like in 10 years? Give a little thought to that. Now, our first speaker will be Shri, Shri Navas Govindarajan from SAP Toastmasters. Thank you, Mr. Shri Navas, good luck. Back in the 90s, when I was growing up in this magnificent city called Bombay, I used to think that Silicon Valley is one of the finest places to be. And almost 10 years later, when I was uh, hired by this wonderful software company called SAP, I had a chance to relocate to Silicon Valley. And I should say I was not disappointed. It's a great place. I got to meet some of the brightest people, like the ones who are seated right here in the audience. And it has helped me a lot, both professionally and personally. And I like to think that 10 years from now, it will still be a great place to be. Because we still have a lot of software companies. We still have some of the finest people uh, in uh, I would say in uh, one of the few places in the world that is Silicon Valley. And I also like to think that some of the problems that we are facing currently in terms of unemployment and so on will also be uh, hopefully gone by then. And I, I especially enjoy this place for its beautiful scenery and for all the environment uh, environmentally conscious individuals that we run li that live here and I can I just hope that in 10 years from now it will be even better than what it is now needless to say it is one of the finest places some of the some of the most smartest people whom I have run into live in this part of the country and I love Silicon Valley Mr. Table Topic Master thank you thank very you. much Shri. that was a very good answer Right off the top of his head. Could, could you imagine being able to talk like that right off the top of your head? Well, we're going to give another person an opportunity. Incidentally, all the table talks, topic speakers are from SAP Toastmasters, which is in Palo Alto. And by the way, it's my home club also. All right. The next topic is, <coughs> let's say you have, you're in a beautiful garden. You're in your favorite beautiful garden. What would you see? Tell us what you see in your beautiful garden. Fred? Fred Wallace? Oh, there you are. Thank you. Fred? It's Toastmaster. Tell us what you see in your favorite garden. Thank you. Well, in my most beautiful garden, I first envisioned my beautiful wife, Diana, taking care of the beautiful flowers that we might have there. And we would have just an assortment of flowers, all beautiful colors. We love just beautiful pastels and uh, beautiful, bright, vivid colors, um, colors of uh, plants that are tropical, because my wife comes from the, from the islands. And so we certainly would want to have some flowers representative of that part of uh, in our garden. So this would just be a beautiful garden. And it would just be full of uh, a beautiful green grass surrounding the, the garden. Just it would be something that you might see in a Sunset magazine. Um, so that's, that's what I envision my beautiful garden looking like. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster. Very good, thank you. Well, I'd sure like to visit that garden. Next topic is, for a surprise, is uh, let's, 
let's say you're not in a garden, but you're out in space. Visualize yourself flying on the first rocket to the closest star to our planet Earth, and that star is Alpha Centauri. Imagine what that would be like, or maybe you know because you've studied a little astronomy. So tell us what that star is going to be like. And uh, Justin, thank you. <laughs> Justin, tell thank us. Thank you, Mr. Taping Topics, the yes, sure. Well, that's kind of an interesting thing about, tra about space travel because mm, I was talking, uh, talking to my daughter about, you know, she, was, she, was she was asking me, what are aliens like? And I said, well, what are aliens like? Well, and then I thought about, <clears throat> well, why don't, you, let's, why don't you look at the, uh, you know, the movie E.T., the ex extraterrestrial? I mean, that's a really, that's a, you know, really <clears throat> interesting way to, to, to depict someone who came, came from you know, outer space or something. Now, I would imagine there would be some very uh, intelligent beings uh, that uh, over in Alpha Centauri. I mean, they would they would have minds to match the best we have to offer in Silicon Valley, and then some, all right. And while I think ET's a really intelligent guy, I think um, he's just maybe he's really just relatively um, you know at a relatively early d developmental stage, and so I would imagine that. It's kind of like if, if I was to go out to Alpha Centauri and go out in space travel, I think I would be so impressed. Uh, you know, I'd be challenged to see, to see what, what they would be doing. Uh, they would probably also challenge and ask what we on Earth are, be, are, are doing or are like. And that also brought up something from my childhood. Uh, there was a, a show called Big, Big Blue Marble. It's like that, you know. It was something that I saw Bill was, was carrying around, like a big stone. <clears throat> and so as I'm going off into space, I'm, I see the Earth, the big blue marble, receding. And I'm saying, goodbye. But I know I'll have fun going out to Alpha Centauri. Mr. Table Topics Master. All right. I wish I could come along with you. That sounds like a nice trip. All right, now I have another table topic. You know, one of the big issues in Silicon Valley is funding. A lot of us worry about funding for our companies or maybe our own projects. Suppose you had unlimited funding. You could pursue any project you wanted or study anything you wanted. What would you study? Rishi Nakra. <laughs> Rishi. Thank you, Bill. And that's a very good question that you asked, Bill, because if I could choose any kind of area that I would study with unlimited funding, it would go along the lines of developing alternative sources of energy and using those sources of energy. I've been reading and studying a lot of this famous scientist back in the early 20th century named Nikola Tesla. And, the, and the, the type of inventions he created were just very fascinating how he used the energy, how he was able to grab energy from the earth and be able to practically power, power his house. Unfortunately, Tesla was someone who was very secretive and guarded a lot of his own work and never wrote down a lot of what he studied and what he invented. So with the unlimited funds that Bill will so graciously give me, I would love to be able to discover what Nikola Tesla did and try to recreate his work. And then who knows, maybe in 10 years in Silicon Valley, all of us will be flying in jetpacks because that's what I like to envision in the future. Even whether it's a future 10 years from now or even tomorrow, all of us in jetpacks. Back to you, Bill. Sounds like fun. Thank you, Rishi. And now, I have another question. Supposing you were way up on a mountain and you had a, an observatory totally to yourself so that you could look anywhere on this through the big telescope in this observatory. You could look anywhere across Silicon Valley. You could look anywhere in the world or you could look at any star. Where would you look? Jennifer Richardson, you want to give us a a try at explaining to you to us what you would look for. Thank you, Jennifer. Hello. If I had an observatory, I would look 
at certain people, but I would let them know in advance <laughs> that, uh, that I was going to be looking at them so that they wouldn't be caught off guard or they wouldn't be in the middle of something else. So the people that I would choose to look at would be my little niece. She's turning one next week. So I would love to look at her. Right now, my older brother and my mom babysit for her, and they send me pictures on my iPhone, and she's getting cuter and cuter. So my observatory would be pointed right at her, playing with her stuffed animals. And it would also be pointed at a family that I lived with when I did a semester abroad in Kathmandu, Nepal. They're very far away, and I don't get to see them very often. So I would zoom in and see how they're doing and see, see what they're eating and all the things that I used to enjoy when I was with them. And I would also zoom in on some college friends of mine who I had a lot of fun with, um, but I haven't been able to see for a long time. So it would definitely be people, but I would let them know ahead of time so that they could call me. And it would almost be like a very expensive telepresence machine because I would be using this observatory and the capabilities of the observatory instead of Cisco's telepresence machine, which would probably be much more efficient. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Bill. <laughs> thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. I think Jennifer knows something that I wasn't totally clear on. Actually, we have a, another video that we're going to show you. This is actually from Cisco Speakers, and this is a video that demonstrates how you can carry on a Toastmasters meeting via telepresence. So now we can roll that video, if you will. Thank you. Uh, I would now request Jim to read out objectives of P3. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster, fellow members, and most welcome guests. Uh, Gary's project is Get to the Point. Well, what we just did is we had a telepresence meeting, what's called a point-to-point -point meeting. So we had two rooms. Half the room is here in San Jose, and the other half that we had was in Singapore. Now, this is a great idea for Toastmasters. I would like to see these meetings occurring at least once a quarter. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. You need very different skills than a normal face-to-face -face meeting. The eye contact, do you look at the person, do you look at the camera, moving your head forward or backward to emphasize or de-emphasize a point, using your hands, but you're sitting so you can't be up and walking around. So. The way that we communicate and present is very different than when you're in front of an audience on a podium. I was expecting that we would have delays in our conversation, but no, it's just like we're talking across the table. This is great. I'm glad to be a part of it. Technologies like this are going to get more and more popular, and you'll see different ideas popping up, and the way we communicate in the future is going to change, and I think we're really on to, on to the future here. And what brings us together is this movement called Toastmaster. And we learn communication and leadership to enhance our communication skills, where we can bring all these skills back to our workplace, back to our family, and back to our society. I think we're breaking into something new. This is going to be a way that we all need to be comfortable in communicating in the future. And before long, there'll be lots of other Toastmaster meetings occurring like this. The major paradigm shift of the Homo sapiens is just around the corner. Welcome to the new world. Excellent. Thank you very much for attending. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Bye. It's good to see you. Have a good day. <laughs> Wasn't that a very interesting way to have a Toastmasters meeting? It's as if they were across the table, but they were halfway around the world. Very interesting. 
Now we're going to have a real speech right here in the studio from a member of Electric Toasters. That's a club very close to here. It's right in Palo Alto. Ula Gustafson from Electric Toasters is going to speak to us on terrorists. What terrorists? Ula. Thank you, Ula. Thank you. What if I told you that there are some people in Palo Alto who are harboring underground terrorists? And it's, just in the, it's the same thing in the community where I live. These terrorists are working hard to develop underground tunnels, a big network of them. They have, invi they have uh, invaded my property. We are besieged. And these terrorists are pocket gophers. Gophers are excavators. And when they dig their tunnels, they put all the dirt in their cheeks. And when they get to the end of the tunnel and surface, they put the dirt down in mounds. You should see my backyard. It looks like a minefield. There are gopher mounds everywhere. And it seems as if I turn around, there is another one popping up. Gophers are dedicated vegetarians. And they are very selective too. When they are walking in their tunnels, they zero in on the best roots and the most expensive plants. Hmm, I wonder how much this one costs. I'll take it. I wonder if there is another one. There isn't. Oh, these people are so cheap. <laughs> there I was standing, looking at my tulips, and they had just opened up. And all of a sudden, I saw a movement, slow movement, mo downward. And all of a sudden, the plant disappeared. And then the next tulip, I knew what it was. I grabbed hold of the stalk of that third tulip, and I held on, and I played a tug of war with the terrorist <laughs> underneath. And I knew who was going to be the winner. Just look at my patch of agapanthus plants with those fleshy, juicy roots. It's a, it's a virtual fast food restaurant for, for the gophers. And one tilts over, I lift it up, and there is no root. You should see the lime tree we planted. It was healthy. It had been in the ground maybe for about three weeks or so. And I saw that it was kind of leaning over a little bit. And the leaves were getting a little bit yellow. So I grabbed hold of the trunk. And I wanted to steady it. And I almost fell backwards. There was nothing holding this tree to the ground. And then I found out that a, go that a gopher had set up house under the root ball. It was a cozy little, little den and chowing down on those roots. Now, how do you get rid of these pests? You could always send them over to the neighbors, but that's not very neighborly. And I, can be, I would be sure that they would send them back to us. And then we will be in the same trouble again. Or you could look at traps. Don't bother with these technical gizmos, such as uh, buzzers and gas and bombs and sprays. They don't work. We have tried it. You may want to set a few traps. Or if you have a terrier dog which has a very sensitive nose, 
you might engage the dog services. That's what we do. We simply tell our dog, go and find those gophers. And she goes right away, butt up, tail wagging, and she starts digging like a virtual digging machine and the dirt is coming and coming and it doesn't take her long and she has unearthed some tunnels and some gophers too. Now, if you don't have a dog with terrier genes, I do suggest you use traps. What we do, we take a trap and set it and put it in the tunnel and then we put some nice green grass on top and then a vegetable or two. Gophers love carrots. That's what we do. But our dog loves carrots too. Oh. So there we were and she saw what we were doing and I told her, don't touch. This is the gopher's carrot. And she looked at me and she look, looked at the carrot and she said, you've got to be kidding. Why waste a good carrot on a gopher? I told it to be in the house. And after a while, I went outside and there she was with a carrot sticking out of her mouth like a, like a Havana cigar. <laughs> And what about that gopher that was hiding in a tunnel? Well, the trap took care of him. I have some suggestions for you. If you are not too keen on trapping, you may want to send the gophers on a one-way ticket to the neighbors, but I'm not going to guarantee that it works. Instead, why don't you hire a terrier dog. I'm open for negotiations. Mr. Toastmaster. <laughs> Ola, thank you. Now, I didn't know that uh, gophers could be terrorists, but I guess if you really love gardens, then that would be one of the worst things for your garden. It's a full-time job. Oh, what a job. Uh, speaking of jobs, uh, where is electric toasters? Is that, is, do you, is that a company where they make toasters and electric equipment like that? No. Electric comes from Electric Power Research Institute. Really? Mm -hmm. And toasters, that's part of Toastmasters. So we, of course, call it electric toasters. How clever of you. Isn't it? Yeah. Where are you located? We are located in Palo Alto on Hillview Avenue. Mm -hmm. in, we will meet in one of the meeting rooms at Electric Toasters. Is it an open club or is it just for EPRI people? No, it is an open club. Oh. And I think that's the strength of our club, actually. Wow. I think that is great. You, I think <laughs> anybody can join Electric Toasters and uh, we, we invite them to do so. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, we're running out of time. <laughs> Now, to evaluate Ula so she'll get the maximum value out of her speech and carry something home with her, we have Rajiv Prabhakar. Rajiv is a member of two clubs, Intel and Star Speakers, and now he's going to give some good feedback to Ula. Rajiv. Thank, Thank you, Rajiv. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster, and thank you, Ula, for a very entertaining speech. The object of your speech was to entertain the audience and just from my own reaction and hearing everyone else around me, I was thoroughly entertained. Everyone was thoroughly entertained. Great job on that speech. What did I like about your speech? Let me start off with a couple of things. I think the two most important things in your speech are the opening and the ending. And I really liked your opening. You came up here and you said in a really, really low voice, how would you feel if I told you that right here in Palo Alto, people are harboring terrorists? It's happening in my house and it's called a gopher. I really liked that opening because number one, it told all of us what the speech was going to be about. And number two, it got our attention right off the bat. You mentioned Palo Alto, it's something we can all relate to. You mentioned harboring terrorists in our home. That's something that immediately perks us up. That's a great opening. I also liked your ending. It was kind of a little summary, but you also 
fulfill the objective of your speech at the ending. You, you end up by saying, if you have a girlfriend in your house, don't send it to your neighbor. Consider hiring a dog. My services are up for sale. <laughs> That's a good way to really summarize the whole, uh, what the speech was about. And also, the uh, object of the speech was to be funny. You had a lot of vocal tone and variety in there. I really like that. Like, for example, when you talked about how the gophers are damaging your backyard, you said, you should see my backyard. It looks like a minefield. That was really great. When you change up the tone, when you change up the vocal variety, it really makes us lean forward and, and listen to you more. And when you suddenly shift it up with a punchline, that's how you really deliver a strong punchline. I also like your body language. You look very natural up here. You told me earlier that you're feeling nervous, but that did not show at all. You're walking around here very comfortably. You're doing all kinds of things. Like, for example, you talked about your dog and how his tail was wagging. You're acting it out a little bit. You talked about how the dog was uh, digging and digging for up the dirt and how everything was flying all over the place. And you also talked about uh, um, the tail wagging and the uh, digging. Um, as for the speech content itself, I think this is where you really shown. What I really liked about your speech was that you had a lot of stories, a lot of anecdotes, a lot of little jokes sprinkled throughout the entire speech. And that's what really made your speech very entertaining. Now, there were a few things that I felt like you could have improved on. The very small one was that I felt that the title was kind of misleading. You talked about terrorists. What terrorists? I thought that the speech was going to be kind of about terrorism, but it was something completely different. But that was a very minor thing. The biggest thing that I felt you could have done differently was to really speak a little bit louder when you're talking. A big part of being an entertaining speaker is delivering enthusiasm, energy. And the best way to do that is by speaking at a very high voice and speaking fast. But overall, great speech. I look forward to your next one. Thank you. Thank you, Rajiv. <laughs> that was a great evaluation. Thank you for being here through Beta Bay. We'll talk to you again next month.